You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel. I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. This program is a Bible answer and uh, we answer viewers' questions on a Bible answer. We hope that you'll tell other people about this program. We've been on uh, since 2004 throughout this region and uh, we're on in four states and also over the internet. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Hello, my name is Brent Arnold and I work with the Greenfield Church of Christ in Greenfield, Tennessee. Hello, my name is Terrence Manis and I work with the Troy Road Church of Christ in O'Brien, Tennessee. Hi, I'm Michael Gilbert and I've been honored to work with the Gardner Church of Christ for almost seven years down in Martin, Tennessee. Good to have these brethren with us today. Our first question goes to Brother Manis. Brother Manus, why did Paul circumcise Timothy when he had so earnestly opposed circumcision of new converts? Brother Manus. Let us consider Acts chapter 16, verses 1 and 4. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, and believed, but his father was a Greek which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. For, th for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and of the elders were, which were at Jerusalem. Paul saw the great potential of young Timothy and decided to take him along as he and Silas uh, continued their missionary journey for the Lord. But since a great part of the, their work would be among the Jews, the apostle knew that it would be expedient to circumcise Timothy. This had not been done earlier because his father was a Greek or a Gentile. The subject of circumcision had been settled as far as faithful Jewish Christians were concerned, but unbelieving Jews would certainly make a big issue out of his being uncircumcised, thus hindering their missionary efforts. Paul refused to circumcise Titus because he was a Gentile, Galatians chapter 2, verses 2, 3 through 5. If Paul had circumcised Titus, he would have been giving to end to the Judaizers, thus rendering unnecessary the decree issued by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. Circumcision has no intrinsic spiritual value today, according to Galatians 5 and verse number 6, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse number 18. One who seeks to follow part of the Mosaic law is under obligation to follow all of its precepts, Galatians 5 and verse number 3. But, one, but when one exhausts the law, he has fallen from, gr from grace, Galatians 5 and verse number 4. When you consider 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 18, Paul says, is any man called to be circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. If any called in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. Galatians 5 and verse number 6, 4, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So why did Paul circumcise Timothy? He did it for expedience sake because he was carrying him on a missionary journey and did not want to allow him being uncircumcised to hinder the unbelieving Jews as they were trying to carry the gospel to the then known world. We thank you to the, for the question. Thank you, Brother Manis, for that good answer to Brother Gilbert. How can you be called righteous while dwelling in wickedness? 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8, Brother Gilbert. I appreciate that question very much. I'll do my best to give a good answer. Uh, number one, Lot did not practice the wickedness himself. And number two, he never embraced that wickedness. That's two important points to remember when we think about Lot. 
Now, even though he never embraced their evil actions, I mean, after all, Peter said that the righteous man who dwelt among them in seeing and hearing uh, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He saw the deeds, he heard the deeds, but he never practiced those deeds, right? So that's pretty important. Not much is known about Lot from the Old Testament. I mean, just not a lot of information is is given in the grand scheme of things like we have with Abraham or some of the other uh, greater known Bible characters. But what Moses did write about him is often disappointing. In fact, you might say that he was a pathetic example of compromise and disobedience. In fact, on the eve of Sodom's destruction, when he should have fled the city, Genesis 19.16 says that he lingered and the angels had to seize his hand and pull him out of the city. Near the end of his life, his two daughters got him drunk and uh, they enticed him to commit incest, Genesis 19.30-38. So Lot seemed to have a tendency for sins of compromise and worldliness and that's not a very flattering uh, uh, testimony to this man. Yet, Peter writes that Lot was oppressed by the worldly conduct of those unprincipled citizens of the city of Sodom. Peter says that when he saw and heard their deeds, he felt his righteous soul tormented on a regular basis. That tells me this about Lot. He hated sin and he had a desire for righteousness. That's commendable. Number two, he had respect for God's holy angels. That's evidence that he feared God. That's a wonderful thing. Number three, he obeyed God by not looking back at Sodom when God's judgment rained down, Genesis 19, 26. And in that, he was certainly more righteous than his wife. That's important. Lot was not worldly in the sense that he lacked all spiritual desire. He did live in a wicked place. He shouldn't have made that decision to go down there, but he was not wicked himself. Right? His soul was tormented day after day. It was vexed or grieved or tortured at the sights and sounds of the evil that, that was all around, the evil in the city that, that he lived in. And, but even though that was the case, evidently his conscience did not become seared. He never fell into practicing the sin of sodomy that... Uh, is the sin for which we remember uh, the city of Sodom, homosexuality. Lot's sin was, and, and this is kind of interesting to put it this way, but Lot's sin was that he did in fact vex his soul from day to day with their unrighteous deeds and did nothing about it and said nothing about it. It's often been said that silence is often golden. But sometimes silence can be just plain yellow. And here's some consequences of Lot's sin of silence. He lost his home because he continued to vex his soul with their unrighteous deeds and not doing anything or saying anything about it. Number two, his wife was killed by divine judgment because of his sin of compromise and worldliness. Number three, his own daughters ended up disgracing and debasing him. Friends, he paid a terrible price for his sin of compromise for being tormented day after day and not saying or doing anything about it. You know, if Lot teaches us anything, it's this. That you and I as God's children cannot sin with impunity. As Peter wrote, the main message that we should take from Lot is this. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly out of temptations. God took Lot out of that. He had a desire to do right, even though he was compromising at times and, and he was not a good example at times, but he had a desire and God took him out of that situation, rescued him out of that situation, and he also reserved the wicked for punishment at the proper time. You see, God always chastens, disciplines his children who sin, and Lot was no uh, uh, exception to that. Lot never turned his back completely on God. He always had a desire for God, even though he didn't always make the right decisions. And he sinned just like you and I sometimes sin. And God kept working on his life to make him a better person. It was good that Lot was sensitive, sensitive to the evil that was in his world, but it was wrong for Lot to put himself in a position where he was vexed with that sin every day and he did nothing and said nothing about it. He knew better than to put himself and his family in that position. He was righteous, but he sinned when, he's led his fa when he led his family to such a city as Sodom, and God punished him dearly uh, for that sinful compromise. Thank you for that good question.
Now to Brother Arnold. Brother Arnold, how do you keep from thinking impure thoughts? Brother Arnold. Well, the fact of the matter is this is a question we should all be asking ourselves if we are serious about living a faithful Christian life. If we're going to live a pure life in the sight of God, it, then having a pure mind or, or maintaining pure thoughts is the key. Over in Proverbs 4.23, the Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. Guard it and protect it and watch over it. For out of it are the issues of life. Think about a well. In ancient times, uh, water was a, a treasured commodity and wells were protected. If an enemy contaminated a well, then every time water was drawn from that, it was going to carry that disease uh, wherever it went. In a similar way, our hearts or our thoughts are the well from which the choices that we make are drawn. And if that well becomes contaminated with impurity, then everything we do, the way we look at life, everything about us is going to be affected by that contamination. I think about Matthew 15, 19, where the Lord said, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. All choices ultimately begin in the heart. They begin in the thoughts. Murder begins with the hatred in the heart. Uh, fornication and adultery begins with the lust, the impurity that's in the heart. Theft uh, and false uh, a theft begins with the covetousness that's in the heart. False witness begins with the dishonesty that's in the heart. And blasphemy begins with the irreverence that's in the heart. It all starts there in those thoughts. And that's why the Lord said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5 and verse 8. So how do we do that? Well, for one thing, we must be careful to guard our eyes and our ears if we're going to keep our hearts pure. We cannot continually bring before our eyes things that are impure if we intend to keep our hearts pure. We cannot allow into our ears messages that are impure if we intend to keep our hearts pure. Uh, and when I think about Matthew 5, 28, the Lord said that I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Notice that what happened in his heart started with the manner in which he was looking at another woman. If he would have protected himself from impure thoughts, he needed to be more careful about where he was looking and how he was looking. Job said in Job 31.1, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Notice the connection between what Job was thinking and where Job was looking. Now, obviously, we cannot always control the things that come into our view. But we do have a choice in the uh, types of movies that we watch, the websites that we visit, the magazines that we purchase, or, or uh, the music that we listen to, and uh, the, the companions that we choose. Well, there are lots of choices that we can make, and when we do our best to make the right choices, to make pure choices, uh, we establish an environment where it's much easier for us to maintain pure thoughts. When I think about uh, this particular uh, principle, I'm rem reminded of a couple of examples from the Bible. Joseph comes to mind. Potiphar's wife tempted Joseph. She, she tried to seduce him to committing sexual sin with Joseph. And uh, she uh, would, would position him from day to day. And over and over again, this temptation went, went along. And uh, Joseph was able to resist that temptation. In fact, on the occasion when she took hold of him, he left his coat in her arms and he ran away. And he had the courage, he had the, the discipline, he had the strength to be able to resist a powerful temptation. And I am sure it was quite a spiritual battle for Joseph day after day when this woman is dressing the way that she was probably dressing and saying the things that she was saying to him. I'm, I'm certain it was a battle for him to maintain pure thoughts. But how did he do it? Well, on one occasion when she uh, approached him, he said, How can I then do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph was able to resist temptation because he kept his thoughts in a spiritual and godly place. If he had not done that, 
he would not have been able to resist. Now contrast that with David in 2 Samuel chapter 11. As he's walking up there on the roof, he looks down, I think probably accidentally, seeing a beautiful woman bathing herself. Her name was Bathsheba. And he was obviously drawn to this woman. She was very beautiful. She was attractive. And um, it was only natural that he would be attracted to a, a beautiful woman. But what David did next is what ultimately led to his downfall. Instead of uh, 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 walking away from that situation, he began to think about that woman. He began to fantasize about her and lust after her. He began to inquire about her. And uh, he asked about her, and it was revealed that she was the daughter of Eliam, and she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. That should have stopped David in his tracks right there. Uriah was one of his most trusted soldiers, his protectors. And if David's thoughts had uh, seen the bigger picture there, if he, had, if he had chosen to focus on the spiritual aspects of what was at work instead of the physical and fleshly, it might, it might have turned out much differently, but instead he focused on the physical. He sent for her, he lay with her, and, and then eventually you know the rest of that story. Now, it's nearly impossible to say, well, just don't think about things that are impure. Uh, for example, if I said to you right now, do not think about a spotted elephant. Well, what are you thinking about right now? Uh, if I tell you not to think about something, if you tell yourself not to think about something, you're more prone to think about it. There are many thoughts that arise involuntarily. So it's more a matter of learning how to redirect our thoughts. When impure thoughts arise, can we redirect them to thoughts that are pure and positive? I think this might have something to do with what Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians 10:5 when he talked about bringing our thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ, wrestling with those thoughts and bringing them under control so that they can be used for a pure and positive purpose. So can we redirect our minds in a moment of temptation? Can we re maybe redirect our minds to the cross and rem remember there what Jesus did for us and the love that He showed? And can that be motivation to make the pure choice? Can we redirect our minds to Scripture? like Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart. Or maybe can we redirect our minds in prayer or in song? And, and after all, that song, pure in heart, that would be a good one uh, to have available in that moment. Can we redirect our minds to the bigger picture like Joseph did when he realized that while there might be a moment of pleasure in that sin, in the grander scheme of things, he would be sinning against God. And we can redirect our minds to the consequences of our choices. We can redirect our minds to the future, the eternal future. And that puts things in a different perspective. And hopefully in practicing this redirection, we can get better at it and keep our heart with all diligence. Thank you for this question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free tract. And our tract today is entitled, Lead Me to Some Soul Today. If you'd like our free tract, or our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course. If you're willing to take this, we'll send you the first lesson, study it in hand with your Bible. Send that lesson back to us, we'll grade it and send you lesson two. When you complete all eight lessons in studying with your Bible, we'll send you a certificate for having completed the course. So if you'd like any of our free literature today, or if you'd like to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. Email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net. Call our toll-free number and leave your address, and we'll send you your request or, send, or give us your question either way. 1-800-436-0463. That's the number. You'll see it again shortly at the end of our program. And then remember also our webpage. That web address is www.abibleanswertv.com. A lot of people are contacting us now by means of the contact page on the web page, and that's great. We appreciate you going and looking at our web page. Now, back to our questions. Our next question to Brother Manis. Brother Manis, what is meant by putting a stumbling block in your brother's way? Brother Manis. Let us consider Romans chapter 14. And begin at verse number 13. 
Paul says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block on occasion to fall in his brother's way. He says, for I, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Notice verse number 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walketh thou not charitably. In other words, no longer you're not walking in love. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. And verse number 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. When we consider that Paul is referring to meat and some classify as clean and unclean. And if a person is practicing idolatry and portion of that meat is sold in the market and one purchased that to consume. These verses issues a warning which is directed towards keeping Christians from doing things which will result in their losing their souls. A stumbling block causes one to fall. To fall uh, contemplated is a fall into sin and away from God's grace. Galatians 5 and verse number 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 11 and 12. 12 and 13. Wherefore Paul said let him that think if he stand take heed lest he fall. When you consider Roman, Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Paul urges uh, upon brethren the attitude of love. If our practice in the realm of indifference is going to cause another to stumble or fall, to sin or to fall from God's grace or to become lost, it is better for us not to exercise our freedom. To cause another Christian to fall into sin is to cause him to be lost unless he or she repents. And he who thus prompts another to fall, uh, falls himself. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verses 11 and 13, And though, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren, the Paul says, and wound their weak conscience, Ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, Paul says, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. If the strong Christians practice in non-essential matters, cause the weak one to abandon their faith or to violate their consciences, they have been caused to stumble or fall. Let us remember in matters of faith, unity. In matters of opinion, freedom. In all things, love. Thank you for the good question. Thank you very much. To Brother Gilbert, are the days of Genesis 1 solar days of 24 hours each? Brother Gilbert. All right, very clearly, absolutely, they are solar days of 24 hours each. They cannot be anything else, and it's a mistake to think that they're anything else. William Jennings Bryan in the Scopes Monkey Trials back in Dayton, Tennessee in, uh, years ago uh, said it could have been long periods of time. I appreciate many of the things which William Jennings Bryan stood for and many of the things which he said at that trial. But he was wrong in that particular instance and I regret that uh, he gave in on that point because the Bible does not demand, uh, logic does not demand, History does not demand that <clears throat> those days be anything other than 24-hour days. Evolution demands it, but evolution has been proven time and time again to be a farce. It's been proven time and time again to be an unscientific theory. And in fact, I challenge you uh, to see the lack of credible facts within that theory of evolution. The next time you pick up a magazine that is speaking about the theory of evolution, go through there with a highlighter or a pen and circle or highlight the words that you see such as we think or it may have been. And I guarantee you that that scientific article which is supposed to be relating facts about evolution will be chock full of things that the scientists say we think it may have happened that way. It's a theory. They have no evidence, but it does away with God. 
And so Satan is very happy with that and Satan uses that theory of evolution to promote his ungodly agenda upon the earth. Now, I've got a paragraph for you. I want you to think about the word day in this paragraph. And I want you to tell me how many times, or at least think along with me, how many times the word, how many different ways the word day is used in this paragraph I'm going to read. Here we go. In Abraham's day, God made a covenant with the righteous patriarch and his descendants, saying, Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Genesis 17, 10-12 As long as it was day eight, it may not have mattered if Abraham and his descendants circumcised their young males during the day or the night. In Moses' day, even if day eight fell upon the seventh day, the Sabbath day, the Israelites were expected to circumcise their male children on this day so that the law of Moses could not be broken. Now, how's the word day used in the above paragraph? Very simply, it's used twice in reference to two different general periods of time, the day of Abraham, the day of Moses, the time of Abraham, the time of Moses. It's used once to refer to the opposite of night, and it's used six times to refer to literal 24-hour days. It's not hard to determine what the Bible means when it uses the word day. In Genesis chapter 1, when it says, the evening and the morning were the first day, that is one 24-hour period of time. The only reason that people would consider it otherwise is to try to promote the agenda of evolution. And that agenda, that theory, that system of thinking which denigrates God is opposite of Bible teaching, uh, does not have any traction. There's no reason to think that God did not create the earth in, seven, in six 24-hour days and then rested on the seventh day. I appreciate that good question. From the beginning days of creation to that one day, the, the last day, of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Mark 13, 32. And what a joy-filled thought it is that we shall see the King someday on that last day. And of that wonderful day, there is no doubt. Those who love Him happily look forward to His coming again that day, but no one knows when that day and hour will be. And thus, as Jesus said, we must watch and pray and be prepared for the time when we shall meet the Lord, whenever that is. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.